Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome back to another series brought to you by Azim Premji Universities as part of the Seeking Sustainability Initiative. My name is Shashwat uh, EC and I'm part of the research uh, team at the university. Uh, and I welcome you to this series that is all about nature in our cities, which we, over the past many months, we have been talking about different aspects of nature uh, that lives and thrives within our, you know, right in our neighborhoods. And the idea has been to, you know, bring focus back to things that, uh, you know, the flora and fauna that is around us rather than focusing primarily on the jungles and, you know, um, the different forests that are there. So we, as part of this thing, every month we almost get some expert to talk about one aspect, one species or one aspect of uh, nature. And today it gives me great pleasure to welcome you, uh, welcome all of you to a talk by Professor K.S. Gopi Sundar, who will be talking about, you know, large water birds in India. And to do the honors of this discussion, I have my faculty with me, Monica, who is a avid birder herself and a researcher on this topic, who has worked a long time on this uh, subject. So she'll be doing the conversation today. So without much ado, I'd like to hand over to Monica to, you know, start the proceedings. But before I go, uh, one small request to everyone of you, whatever questions or queries you might have, just type it into the live chat box and we will take them, you know, towards the end of the program, or whatever, whenever uh, Monica feels, uh, you know, comfortable. So with, with, uh, without ado, uh, Monica, the stage is yours, please. Thank you, Shashwat. Uh, it's my immense pleasure uh, to speak to today's expert and someone who we were trying to uh, rope in for a very long time. <laughs> Our schedules weren't matching. Um, Dr. Sundar, I think he doesn't really need introduction, uh, especially to the, uh, the bird watcher or the bird researcher community. But for others, uh, he's been working for more than three decades to understand the biology of cranes, stalks, ibis, spoonbills, and herons, all the beautiful bird that you might have seen in the rural landscape while you are going in a bus or in a train, uh, probably dancing, foraging in, in these uh, agricultural areas of our beautiful country. Um, Dr. Sundar received his master's in ecology and environmental science from Pondicherry University and his doctoral degree from the University of Minnesota. While researchers like me dream of doing their research in deep forest or pristine natural areas away from human habitation, Dr. Sundar was exploring how conservation can be achieved in human dominated landscapes outside pristine forests or protected areas. His PhD dissertation work at the University of Minnesota demonstrated that landscape with long histories of agriculture and human, high human population do not necessarily lead to poorly developed areas. In Dr. Sundar's own word, his primary interest is to understand how human and wildlife coexistence can be achieved, where and when is this coexistence not possible, and to figure out if coexistence can be introduced to areas where they may currently be weak. His work span not only agricultural areas, but cities, wetlands, and cattle grazing areas. Um, on one side, if you read Dr. Sundar's paper, you will actually uh, struggle a bit because of the use of sophisticated modeling and statistical techniques. And on the other side, he's a strong proponent of recording natural history and behavior of wildlife, which also uh, is a very important part of his research. Dr. Sundar is co-chair of IUCN stock, IPIS Spoonbill specialist group. Uh, he heads a program called SARScape of the International Crane Foundation that is implemented in collaboration with NCF as the Crane Wetland Program. In December 2021, he was appointed the editor-in-chief of the journal Waterbirds, the International Journal of Waterbird Biology, and became the first non-North American to be appointed in this position. Uh, he's also a national geographic explorer. Other than that, Dr. Sundar had ment mentored many students for their master's and doctoral thesis and continues to do so. He currently works with student colleagues and partners in Nepal, India, Africa, and Australia. And I'm sorry if I'm missing any country, Dr. Sundar. He's actively sharing his research through more than 150 peer-reviewed publications and book chapter. He has been recognized with Kalzi's Conservation Award for his effort in wetland conservation. He currently resides in Udaipur with his work colleague and life partner, Dr. Swati Tour, where they manage a two hectare farmland using entirely organic methods, something that I envy. <laughs> I'm sure that given his illustrious career, my introduction must have missed a few important details and I apologize uh, for the same to Dr. Sundar. And without any further delay, I request 
Dr. Sundar to give us a glimpse of his fascinating research. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Shashwat. And thank you to Azim Premji for having me in this uh, quite a fascinating set of uh, discussions and the talks that you've been having. And as Monica knows, and as uh, many of the other people who have done ecology in this country and in this part of the world know, we very seldom have people who step outside of pristine areas to look at wildlife. And we have set up a lens, uh, perhaps in the past, which is changing very rapidly now, that you require not to have humans if you need to have beautiful species. And uh, very few people have stepped out in a way to, uh, uh, in a sense, to, to be able to showcase what is happening and what species need. And today's talk, I won't be talking too much about the analytics or the philosophy or the anything, but I just want to celebrate a few species that I've been uh, working on in multiple landscapes around the world. And that's and those species are cranes, herons, ibises, and storks. So I'll focus largely on the Saras crane because a lot of people like that bird and they want to hear a lot about the bird. But I will be weaving in aspects uh, of the larger you know, gambit of this particular talk, nature in cities and outside protected areas, to give a sensibility, I hope, uh, where you'll be able to see that our lenses truly require to be modified if we want to see the wonder that uh, currently seems to be prevalent in South Asia. South Asia seems to be very unique in this because I've traveled around the world and uh, very, very few countries in the world, uh, I would say, have the kind of wildlife that we do outside protected areas. And um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll try and give you a sort of a photographic with a couple of maps, uh, a story, if you will, of uh, of cranes and a couple of anecdotes of other species of large water birds that I've been working on. And all of these are, of course, not in protected areas. So you will see from the photographs where they are. And uh, I hope through the talk, I'll be able to help bring out some questions regarding these areas that we don't pay attention to, these species that we have not paid too much attention to, and also bring focus on a couple of aspects of conservation, especially you know, red, red list uh, uh, status, the behaviors of the birds and how it interacts with both farmers and the landscape, how important is weather for these birds, uh, given that climate change is occurring. And I hope after this brief uh, presentation that we can have a more uh, vibrant discussion. So I'll start my PowerPoint, uh, or rather the, the slideshow. Can you, ah, yeah, this should be visible. So today I want to talk about living with Saras cranes and you know, it should, should strictly be in brackets and other large water birds because that's the, the Saras is going to be the hero of the talk because there are so many elements of this bird that work very nicely for the theme of this uh, talk session, which is nature in our cities and beyond cities. In this photograph, you can see two birds, which are, I mean, sorry, two species that are record-breaking species. On the on your left is the largest antelope in the country, and on the right are two birds, which are the tallest flying birds of the world. So these are very, very big animals, a mammal and a bird. And the fascinating thing about these two, and why I wanted to start the talk with these two, is the largest known population of both of these species is not in a protected area. Both of them are known to be thriving in farmlands in South Asia. The Saras, of course, is found in other areas, as I'll show you. And so this begs the question, and you can see in the photograph, the landscape is very heavily used agriculture without even an inch spared for uh, wildlife, as it were. And it sort of begs the question is saying, how is it that we have such large species doing apparently so well and having the largest proportion of their populations in areas which are outside the gambit of strict protection for wildlife. And that is the question which I want you to dwell on a little bit and perhaps move on to uh, when we move on to the question answer session. So cranes are not new to human beings. Scenes like this are extremely common. Farmers know cranes as uh, their companion on the landscape for a very, very long time. They are not strangers to each other. And I'll show you some examples of uh, behavior which shows how well close-knit, these two species have become humans and uh, th this particular species of crane, the Saras crane. This photograph was taken in Haryana in a part that is unfortunately soon slated to be the NCR. And as with expanding cities everywhere, they, the, the first thing that they eat up is farmlands. And in India, unfortunately, there is so little information known about the importance of farmlands to beyond cropping, you know, to species like cranes and, and the Nilgai, which is the largest antelope that I showed earlier that we are unable to stem this 
uh, what I would term as a disastrous decline, because it is on these landscapes that we not only produce our foods, but we also provide a really wondrous, fascinating, interesting landscape and habitat for a whole myriad range of species, including, of course, this Sarah strain. Uh, in this map, you can see that the Saras is a fairly wide distribution relative to some of the species that are endemic to the Indian subcontinent or South Asia. You can see that it has uh, a large chunk of the population in uh, South Asia, with India being responsible for the largest population in the world. There's a lot of work going on in Southeast Asia because there the population is heavily fragmented, and that is the only population that seems to require protected areas, the odd one out being the population in Myanmar, where recently some of the colleagues in WCS have uh, shown that the Saras in Myanmar lives in places that are identical to the places in India. Uh, and then we have the Saras all the way in Australia. So it's a very, very old species that has been on the on the earth, you know, you know, before Pangaea and so on. I mean, during Pangaea rather. And so it is very likely that, you know, it's, it used to be a, a single population or at least a population which was closer to each other than what we see today. And genetically, they don't, it doesn't seem to be too much difference between the Saras cranes across these populations because being such an old clade, it likely speciates very, very slowly. So the Saras is very odd in the sense that it's a crane that is found uh, resident both in snowy and uh, you know, snow clad areas like this. This photograph is from Himachal Pradesh, where now the cranes have started to stay on through the year. In the past, it was thought that these cranes leave the area when it snows. But now with more and more people paying attention to birds across the country and in fact across the world, we now know that many, many pairs of uh, uh, several pairs of Saras cranes in Himachal are likely staying back and living in the snow. And this should not be unusual because the fossil record shows these cranes to be to have lived in Europe. Uh, which we know is a temperate area. And in uh, captivity, the Saras crane is among the last species in, uh, you know, in Northern America and, and in Europe to walk into their cell when the snowfall begins, because it is a species that seems to be very hardy and seems to be used to the cold. It is also a species that we are now discovering as part of our work uh, over two and a half decades. That is a species that's also found in semi-arid areas. This is a photograph taken in Rajasthan where you now have governmental impetu to bring in more and more wetness on the landscape. So these two cranes are actually inhabiting an artificial reservoir. And in the background, you'll see a very unlikely habitat for cranes in general, which is the Aravali Mountains. And the Aravali Mountains are very rocky. They have very shallow soil surface. It's not an area where you would expect to see cranes. But what we are seeing is in areas that you bring in new water, the cranes are able to expand fairly quickly and do reasonably well as resident birds and breeding birds in those areas. There is still quite a lot to be found out about these cranes, even in terms of basic natural history, let alone more complex, uh, complex aspects of ecology. So this particular crane has been uh, in human culture, like many cranes around the world have been in culture in the countries where they occur in. The Saras has been in Indian culture. So this is a representative painting uh, made by a colleague in Bangalore that shows the story of Valmiki cursing the hunter who kills one of a pair of Saras cranes when they were dancing. It is thought that the curse was uttered in the form of a, pro, or in the form of a poem. And that's how the Ramayana, the, one of the epics of the Hindu religion begins. And so the cranes have an incredibly close knit integrated role to play in our epics and uh, in our ancient culture as far as we can make out. Uh, this particular story uh, is thought to have taken place in the banks of the Ganga in Allahabad. Unfortunately, today there are no Saras cranes there because of very heavy development and because of incredibly uh, high levels of disturbance in the wetlands that these cranes require. The other famous story, which is a little bit more recent, is the story of Prince Siddhartha rescuing an injured Saras crane in, uh, we think it was in Nepal where this happened. And uh, this particular story, the king gives the ownership of the crane to Siddhartha, who went on to become, we believe, Lord Buddha, because he rescued the crane, as opposed to his brother, who shot the crane. So cranes are interwoven like this in our culture uh, and into stories of, of both mythology, religion, epics, and a whole bunch of other things. And I'm just giving you a small picture of how far back they go. In terms of research, this person beat me to it. Uh, Emperor Jahangir was the first person to put bands on Saras cranes and to actually study them. He put gold bang bangles on two cranes. It's, uh, it is said from, uh, we can glean from his writings. 
And he was the first person to figure out what the incubation period is of a Cyrus crane. When I began my work on cranes in 1998, there was so little natural history information, even though uh, things like incubation period is extremely important natural history information. And out of the five nests that I could find information of incubation period, Emperor Jahangir's notes on two uh, of the nests were the only existing information in 1998. Now we know a lot more because of work that's going on in Myanmar, in uh, Australia, and of course, all across Nepal and uh, India. And the cranes, as you can see, have attracted attention or, and also interest uh, through history, not just in epics and mythologies, but also by people like uh, Emperor Jahangir, who was known to be uh, a very devout natural historian. And many notes of Indian species uh, the natural history was first described by this person and the Saras cranes, of course, did not escape his interest. The Saras's are <clears throat> truly omnivorous. They eat basically everything that human beings grow for themselves on the landscape, perhaps with the exception of soybean and sugarcane. Every other crop that is grown in the landscape is fair game for the Saras and it is very well known to even get drunk on uh, rotting potatoes. So it became one of my favorite birds when I realized that, like me, it appreciated vodka for what it's worth. It also eats practically every animal that it can get its beak around, as it were, uh, that it finds in the landscape. This includes amphibians, reptiles, includes turtles, eggs of other birds. It also eats smaller birds and uh, small-sized birds and youngsters of water birds like moorhens. So it's a species that is very nicely adapted to conditions in India, which is, as all of you might know, is very strongly seasonal. So we have very strong wet periods, which are great for water birds, followed by winters, which are very, very nice in the sense that a lot of the water remains in the landscape, especially in areas like uh, the Gangetic floodplains. But it's followed by very harsh and severe summers where everything on the landscape dries out. But because of its, perhaps because of its omnivorous habits, and because of the relationship it shares with the people on the land, the Saraces are able to do really well on this landscape, which otherwise we would think to be an incredibly harsh place for such a large bird to find food throughout the year. So the crane behaviors are, uh, are something that has attracted me and attracted a lot of people through history. I mean, I showed you Emperor Jahangir was very curious to know uh, uh, how the males and the females behave. And in this particular photograph, you can see the only time that you can really make out a male from a female crane, and which are the two birds on the left, which who are giving what is known as a unison call or a duet. And duets are very interesting behavioral, uh, you know, you, uh, vocalization in, in the animal world, where more than one individual gets together, in this case, two individuals get together to produce a call, which if you hear from far away, will sound as if it was produced by one individual. It's very nicely synchronized. And we are now trying to learn, uh, along with my student and colleagues, we are trying to figure out whether this synchronization varies, what are the components of the synchronization, and does the SARS unison call, Does it? Uh, can it reflect the health of the system? So these two birds that have opened their beaks and are singing, there is one bird with the wings open and one bird with the wings closed. The word with the wings open is a male, and this is the only time really that you can make out a male from a female SARS. Saras cranes uh, have a very interesting uh, population dynamic. They have breeding pairs that are very strongly territorial. Like in this photograph, they use a wide variety of behaviors, including calls, to push away other cranes that come into their territory. And these breeding pairs uh, don't really shift their territories. And that makes it you know, very, very nice system for us to work in because if you want to study complicated things or rather very important things like breeding success, which is a very uh, important metric for population biology of endangered species, then you can visit the same area every year to figure out if they have managed to raise bears. In an area which has a very high density of Saras cranes, uh, scenes like this are very common. Here you can see two cranes that are meeting at the border of their territories. One of the cranes is giving the unison, one of the pairs is giving the unison call on the left, and the pair on the right is doing what is known as displacement preening. They're pretending that the other bird doesn't exist. Or rather, it is it is conveying to the other birds that they are on their territory and they are not scared of the unison call. So every morning, every pair goes around to the border of its territory, uh, this, doing this display to the pair beside it. And in a high density area, in the mornings, perhaps until nine o'clock or nine thirty in the morning, you can hear loud unison calls of saras cranes. And then it becomes really quiet when they start resuming their activities. 
So for cranes, especially Saras cranes, real estate is very, very serious business because they need to maintain the territory throughout the year. We think that they live on the territory as, lo you know, as long as, they, uh, as they're alive. And so they really need to pay a lot of attention on retaining the territory. We are now finding out a lot of interesting stuff about the unison call. The two graphs that you see are spectrograms of, of two different uh, pairs of Saras cranes. And you can see without the need for a very scientific explanation, just visually, by examining the spectrograms, you can see that the uh, unison calls of each pair is distinct. It's like a thumbprint. So it may be possible for us to do acoustic monitoring to figure out the populations of Saras cranes, especially those that have completed their pairing and have a territory of their own. So we are trying to use technology as much as possible, though, of course, personally speaking, I try not to use technology because I like going out to the field and watching these birds. Given a choice, uh, when a crane has a territory, like in this particular case that you see in the photograph, the dark green patch that you see in the bottom uh, half of the photograph is natural wetlands. And it's very common for farmers uh, in northern India, in, in most states of northern India, to leave behind small patches of wetlands like this, because from there they accrue grasses, they take out uh, lotuses, they take out a whole bunch of wetland vegetation for, for eating and to feed their cattle with. So given a choice, if within a territory the Saras cranes have even a tiny patch like this, they prefer to uh, lay their eggs and make their nest in such a patch. And they will choose uh, a paddy field only if there is really nothing, no natural patch at all. So it's quite uh, an easy way to save the crane where farmers' habits of already retaining tiny, tiny patches of wetlands have ensured that there are literally tens of thousands of pairs of cranes that are scattered across the North Indian landscape as a consequence of the farmers' habits that have intermeshed very nicely and overlapped very nicely with the territorial habits of this particular crane species. I was telling you of how uh, they are not really afraid of human beings. So this was the first nest that I visited when in uh, Uttar Pradesh. And at that time, uh, all of the books and all of the uh, you know experts told me that I have to be really careful about visiting a nest because cranes can abandon the nest. Clearly, this particular pair had not read the books. And the moment I entered the water and reached the egg, they attacked. And this particular behavior really brought home that places like Uttar Pradesh, where farming has been going on for 10 to 15,000 years, and where cranes seem to have benefited from the kind of farming that people do, which is limited, of course, by the monsoon and the very dry summer, that the cranes have taken a sort of a, they've become part of the landscape in a landscape where the human beings are not persecuting these birds. So cranes are not afraid of human beings. They'll come up to you and they will knock you on your head if you try to lift their chicks or if you try to remove their eggs. So this kind of behavior really shows how long this kind of interaction has been going on. And this is certainly not new from as far as we can make out. So this is another uh, sort of a shot of a territory, which is what we would call a very healthy territory. Very little of this territory is farmlands. Most of the territory is wetlands. Now, uh, the large you know, 90, perhaps over 99% of wetlands in India of all sizes are not protected strictly for, uh, you know, wildlife conservation or habitat conservation, but they are conserved as community lands. So the wetlands that you see in this photograph and the wetlands that you will see through the rest of the uh, slideshow are areas that are maintained by villages uh, and village communities for use by human beings. And this is an extremely odd example in textbooks. Uh, the people, of course, know about this for at least 10 to 15,000 years. But in our ecology textbooks, this is one of those very interesting examples where use of a habitat by hordes and hordes of people through the year have allowed this habitat to, uh, to remain on the landscape and in turn has allowed species like the Saras cranes to coexist alongside the farmers and other people on this landscape. So it's a very interesting example of how people using a particular habitat can actually be very good for ecology at very large spatial scale. So imagine the Gangetic floodplains is an extremely large geographical feature. And across the entire Gangetic floodplains, uh, you can find a very large number of birds benefiting from the way that the people have retained their wetlands, primarily to use these wetlands. So the other component of Saras uh, populations are flocks. And these are non-breeding birds. These are birds that are younger birds that have been kicked out by the territorial pairs. 
and they live in flocks. We know very little about the flocks, except that they require medium sized to large sized wetlands like the one that you see in the photograph to rest during the night. During the day, they fly around quite a bit. They, you know, they, there's a lot of jousting that goes on in uh, flocks. We believe that it is a place where uh, partners find each other. There's a lot of dating that seems to go on, a lot of uh, breaking up, and then they come together again. But there is still a lot to be that requires to be done for us to know what is really happening in the flocks. And the good news for India is that 50 to 60 percent of the Saras population are currently existing in non-breeding flocks, which means that if there is an area that is habitable by a territorial pair, that area is currently taken. And there is a huge spare population that we have across the countryside in all the states in which the Saras' occur. And this is indicative of a very healthy population where you have about half the population uh, you know, on the side waiting for territories to clear up should they happen uh, in their lifetime. So this is the 5% of India that is uh, a geographical area that is protected. And about 90 to 95% of scientific research currently that occurs on ecology occurs in these areas. And a very tiny amount occurs outside. And that's a great shame because we have species that are fascinating like the Saras cranes forming bonds with people like the farmers of Uttar Pradesh, farmers of Haryana and Gujarat in a way that seem to have existed there for at least thousands of years, if not tens of thousands of years. So we really need to find a way where we can step out of these uh, very important biodiversity rich areas into areas that we currently don't know much about, but are areas that seem to have incredible amount of diversity, especially species like uh, Saras cranes. So uh, the human population is supposed to be the leading cause of bird declines around the world. But for the Saras and for a bunch of other species that the Saras lives with, it lives in Uttar Pradesh that has amongst the highest uh, human population in the, uh, in, in the country. And it is the place where uh, formal rice agriculture is supposed to have started in the world. So agriculture has been going on for a very, very long time in a place which is intensively and uh, heavily crowded with human beings. So we have this what seems to be a very odd marriage of a place which is crowded by humans, but also crowded by Saras cranes who are jostling on the countryside to take over areas that they require to maintain as territories. So we need to start looking at species like Saras cranes, hearing about species that uh, like Saras cranes and viewing photographs like this a little bit differently. We should not, I think, view them solely as protected versus non-protected areas, areas that are used by humans versus areas that should be left to non-humans. I think we should move away from this thought, which you know was Western conservation principles, which of course has done its bit in conserving the global biodiversity. But in places like India, and we are finding out in a lot of other countries around the world, places like this are certainly not without wildlife. In fact, they support some of the largest populations of many, many species like Saras cranes that seem to do really well on farmlands. The other bird that we've been looking at for a while is the woolly neck stock. It was recently shuttled up to vulnerable and it was thought that its population is less than 25,000. And if you read literature, it was uh, thought to be a species that requires wetlands and it was deemed to be threatened by agriculture. Uh, again, this is a bird that did not read all those books. It's doing absolutely fine in agricultural landscapes in India and in Africa uh, and across uh, Nepal. This photograph is a world record for single nesting stocks like the woolly neck stocks, which don't nest in large colonies, like some of the other stocks do. In this bird, you can see a single bird by itself, which is a parent bird, and six chicks that fledged from that nest. Now, six chicks of such a large bird in one nest was unknown until we discovered uh, the woolly neck stocks of North India. And it is very interestingly, it is not an unusual occurrence. Four to six chicks is fairly you know, common uh, occurrence of the woolly neck stocks in North India. That speaks to the very high quality of the landscapes where they're able to find a huge amount of food to bring up chicks of this size, which require between 200 and 400 grams of non-vegetarian food every day. So you can imagine in tonnage, uh, how much tons of non-vegetarian animal matter is being maintained by the farmlands that we have in North India. And that in, in turn is helping support some of the largest and the most healthiest population of large water birds like Saras cranes, but also birds like woolly neck stocks, which until recently were very poorly understood. So this is the kind of landscape that the woolly neck stocks seem to really like. Very old plantations or even new plantations 
along uh, irrigation canals as part of agroforestry, uh, you know, which is also a very cultural practice in northern India. In this particular photograph, you are seeing a canal which has existed since before the Mughal times. And the practice of agroforestry has been written about during the Mughal times and during the British times. And in those times, very interestingly, people also talk about the woolly neck stock nesting. So it looks like for a few thousand years, the woolly neck stock population in India, at least in some areas, have been enjoying the benefits of how people have been using the land in a way that actually helps them live alongside the farmers and the other people. So now what we have estimated is that there are at least 2 lakh woolly neck stocks because we started doing very serious work and we were able to provide population estimates of this particular species. So you will see that there is a huge gap in what is assumed of species like the woolly neck stocks and what actually exists on the landscape. The other birds that we've been working on where uh, we've seen very, very similar uh, kind of uh, trends appearing are these three species, the Asian uh, open bill, the red-naped ibis, lesser adjutants, all of them very large water birds. The Asian open bill is a species of stock that is one of the very few stocks that we know for sure is expanding around the world because of the spread of rice fields. This particular bird loves the big snails that you find in the rice fields. And so it is spreading along with the rice. So again, it is sort of opposite to what we talk about in terms of agriculture and birds, where agriculture is not being detrimental to the species, but actually being responsible for uh, this species uh, expanding. The lesser adjutant was thought to require undisturbed wetlands. In this photograph, you can see that's absolutely not true. And in Nepal, we've just discovered the largest known breeding population of lesser adjutants, which also happens to be one of the healthiest populations of lesser adjutants. So clearly, all that was perhaps seemingly required was for us to step out into the farmlands and start looking at things a bit seriously, looking at things in a way that the farmers have, al have always seemed to known for hundreds, if not of thousands of years. Similarly, with the red nape ibis, the numbers of these uh, species was thought to be 10,000 birds in declining, but we now know that it is at least 17 lakh birds in South Asia. So that's the level of what is unknown uh, by the scientific community. And we really need to engage much more with our uh, farmer communities, with the communities that have been living alongside these birds for a much longer period of time than we have come to know. And over time, I hope we can recognize unprotected wetlands and agricultural wetlands as places that have bountiful wildlife, not just residential species, but also a whole uh, range of migratory species are reliant on these uh, community lands. So scenes like this uh, have been around for at least 10 to 15 thousands of years, and I don't see this going away, especially in North India. And I'm hopeful that more of you will step out into the countryside and discover a lot more about species like Saras cranes. And who knows, you might find uh, very uh, you know, high levels of populations of other species, both mammals and birds, and help us rethink and reimagine our uh, uh, the what we have thought to be a species depopulate landscape. So these are all the people that have been helping me, and of course, I'm I'm pretty sure I missed out names, but I'm very happy to have a discussion with you. And if there are questions, I'll be very happy to have them. Uh Thank you, Dr. Uh, Gopi. That was amazing, fantastic. I mean, I was <laughs> literally in these uh, agricultural areas and watching these birds. Um, so I'll start with uh, my question, <laughs> and then we'll. I'm really hopeful that we'll receive more questions. Um, this is a very basic question, but I mean, I was wondering when I was doing research, I used to, especially in Wildlife Institute of India, where there are people who are working on uh, charismatic mammal species, carnivores, somebody who is working on birds is actually <laughs> not even considered as a researcher. So I just wanted to ask you, like, uh, of course, endogantitic planes are really amazing. These birds are also very beautiful. But what motivated you as a researcher? Was that the landscape or the species? Well, I had the, you know, fortunate accident of being born in Bangalore. And Bangalore has always had a very vibrant community that looked at uh, natural history. And I was very, in a very early age, was inducted into what was known as the Bangalore Bird Watcher Field Club. It is still active. It goes to, uh, it goes bird watching every second weekend, I believe, uh, of the month. And we get scientists, we get engineers, we get people who are just interested in natural history and who do a really wonderful job of just teaching anybody who comes with them about natural history. 
And one of the first few things that uh, I was inducted into as part of this uh, group was the midwinter waterfowl census, which is still which still goes on as a volunteer activity of counting water birds in wetlands. And when you you know go into marshlands and you are recruited as a person who is responsible for flushing the snipes by going into deep waters, you're essentially hooked for life. So I can blame uh, my Bangalore friends for my very low bank account today. And like you said, for not getting into a charismatic uh, large carnivore in a wonderful, pristine jungle, though, uh, as a formal member of uh, state wildlife boards, I must confess that I do get my share of going into pristine areas. And I do enjoy my bounce with, you know, the gaur and the tiger and all of those other things. But species like the Saras cranes and species that occur outside of protected areas have always been on my mind since childhood, thanks to the place that I was born in, which is Bangalore. That's really good to know. <laughs> OK, um, I was reading one of your paper and I was uh, uh, intrigued uh, by the role of farmers, um, the, the role that they are playing in conserving this particular bird. Of course, I mean, the birds have been in these landscapes for so long and we probably like we try to generalize uh, the relationship being a very harmonious one. But when I was reading your paper, I realized that that's not the story for entire landscape. But the relationship is very different from place to place, even within a state. Especially when I was reading about Eastern versus Western uh, Uttar Pradesh, uh, I was intrigued that what could be the reasons for uh, different attitude of farmer toward uh, this particular species and how that has affected the distribution and breeding of these and the other large water bird that you study. So what's interesting in UP is when you go across a floodplain anywhere in the world, if you go across a floodplain, the population of people start to increase as it reaches the middle phases and the end phases. So in Uttar Pradesh, Western UP is where the Ganges sort of begins and then, you know, it, it reaches a alluvial, the deposition phase when it goes to, starts entering Bihar. And so the human population also is increasing as you go towards the east. So it is more a function of the human population where no longer do we find tiny remnant patches of uh, wetlands left on the landscape. Because there are so many more people vying to get agricultural land and the density of people has increased to the point where uh, wetlands have become almost extinct in vast areas, especially the tiny wetlands that these birds require because they're so territorial. The attitude of the people doesn't change much. I mean, when they see a Saras, they're as protective of uh, the Saras in eastern UP as they are in western UP. The uh, places where you will find Saras in eastern UP are places which have rice and wheat as the... Uh, cycle and that's similar to what you will see in say Aligad or other places in western UP. So the farmer themselves uh, haven't really changed their mindsets but it is the function of the floodplain, the function of human density, the function of things that come with higher human density that seems to have affected the lowering of the populations as you move from west to east. The, uh, the community of birds changes a little bit because obviously as the human density increases, the land holding starts to reduce. And as the land holding reduces, then what we, what we call as intensification of agriculture increases. And the kinds of birds that can manage very highly intensified landscapes are, of course, different from the birds that do better when there is lesser intensification of uh, the landscape. So the bird communities changes quite a bit when you move from western UP to eastern UP. Uh, in eastern UP, you find a lot more larks and, uh, I mean, a lot more populations of uh, some of the larks and stuff because they don't have anything breaking the open landscapes in the summers and that seems to be an area where they do really well as a breeding bird especially in the times when the when there is nothing on the landscape but species like uh, saras species like woolly neck stalks they don't do as well because there is not too much habitat for them um thank you uh, dr sundar so one, again, something that we uh, discussed uh, some time ago, which is, uh, I think, which is also something that you have been uh, emphasizing throughout your presentation is this um, value of natural history observation. Now, in today's uh, uh, research landscape, we realize that people are relying more and more on uh, models, which is actually, I mean, something I think we have to move into that direction. I'm not at all saying that that's not required, but... Um, from your own work, uh, where do you think is the value of natural history observation can actually 
play an important role um i think i'm hinting toward this um, uh, this new behavior that you have uh, uh, unfolded uh, about trios and uh, triads so can you share uh, that work with our viewers sure so the cranes are you know very well known very famous if you will in both uh, scientific literature and also in uh, uh, poetic and other literature to be very territorial so the the unison call the duet of cranes are very famous throughout the world because and that's a very territorial component of their behavior and so they are known to have two birds they don't allow a third bird inside it so we were incredibly surprised when we saw that not only was a third bird included in some of their territories but this third bird had learned to give a call with the other two when it was calling and this this whole makeup of behavior where you have a third crane entering firstly it required several takes and several retakes going back observing it wondering if you had dreamt about it because you know cranes are not supposed to allow a third bird inside their breeding territory especially if there's a if they are a breeding crane and when i started my work in itawa in uh, western up in 1998 uh, out of the 190 or, or 200 something pairs that i was observing two of the pairs were allowing a third bird inside their territories and i've been observing them since then so it's been 24 or 20 20 24 or 25 years of continuous monitoring and every year they allow a third bird inside their territory once the egg has hatched they kick it out as soon as the chick is kicked out they kick out the third bird and then we realize that this is happening across the landscape because we've been working across the landscape in uh, south asia the concept of trios where you have three adult cranes and who are giving out a unison call three birds so we had to coin a new term called triet because it's not no longer a duet it's just three birds and we discovered that cranes have this will to sort of improve their ability of their chicks to hatch that they can change extremely strongly sort of evolved behaviors like territoriality so all of the trios that we saw were on what we would call as very poor quality territory where there was very little wetlands or no wetlands in the territory at all and we found more trios on landscapes like haryana and other places where you know small small wetlands are not very common on the landscape so the cranes were giving us a signal that they are willing to change behaviors if it will help them uh, you know help their chicks survive but they will only do this if the landscape is so bad that they are forced to allow a third bird inside and this speaks not just to the crane uh, being on our landscapes for a very very long period of time because being able to sort of break through what is normal behavioral you know evolutionary behavior and create a new behavior at least for us it's new behavior maybe the cranes have had it for uh, ages but it's not been seen in any crane anywhere around the world so we are now questioning the very basis of what we call as pristine we are now questioning the very basis of do we truly require only protected areas for all the crane species in the world like many of our american colleagues have been propagating in places like mongolia and places like china and in china we are now seeing the black neck cranes are doing really really well in places where new farmland is coming so clearly the western notion of habitat and the western notion of species like cranes not being flexible in these behaviors both appear to be wrong and very fortunate for the cranes that it's wrong because they're able to adjust with some of the stupid things that we as human beings do which is not maintain wetlands on our landscape so naturalist tree plays a very very important role because unless you're watching the crane very carefully and you're you know don't observe them for literally hundreds of hours every every year or maybe thousands of hours every year you would have missed this very very tiny proportion of pairs that allowed a third bird coming in and then you would have missed this triads which happen only in a very short period in the in the year so without natural history you'll very likely miss evolutionary insights you'll probably miss insights that are very important for conservation for example we now know that cranes are fairly adjustable so we don't require to give pristine areas to them but we definitely require to maintain wetlands but we can allow people to use those wetlands and it's only natural history that's allowed us with these deep insights which are very you know critical for countries like india where the human population is unlikely to allow the creation of too many wetland protected areas wow <laughs> uh dr sundar i mean i this is a another the next question is basically something that i think uh, is coming from my personal experiences and i'm uh, wondering <laughs> what your thoughts are on that so for instance this particular uh, aspect of observing bird uh, especially recording natural history observation 
um and also doing let's say research in urban areas cattle grazing areas is something that unfortunately is uh, as far as a researcher i think we struggle a lot to generate funds so how have you ma managed i'm sorry i'm asking you a secret but if you can just share like a uh, researcher like me who probably want to work outside protected areas how can they um uh, raise funds or if there are uh, certain um i don't know relationship that can be built with let's say the forest department with the community or with even um, through let's say csr um has that worked for you and how did how have you been managing to work in uh, these areas so as scientists we do very poorly monica as at uh, telling stories we are very poor storytellers and uh, for fun, for successful fundraising for successful you know developing partnerships and collaborations with people who are not scientists whoever it is it may be a tribal or villager or a government official or a csr person you really need to be able to formulate a story and that story will not come off the bat off the cuff in areas like you know bangalore for example there's so little urban ecology done in bangalore that you may have to do a little bit of work on your own in an area that doesn't you know doesn't require too much expenditure first to figure out what the stories are and there is a story everywhere if there is a barbet then you know there's a story of soft uh wooded trees if there is a hornbill then you know there's a story of fruiting trees in the in the landscape and perhaps their fruiting trees are linked to temples because most temples in the country leave aside a fig tree so you really have to see the landscape as a storyteller you say you have to see the species as a storyteller and if you're able to weave a story and that's what has been very useful for me and partly because i grew up in a house that had more books than it had anything else and so very early on uh, my family especially my parents instilled in me the need to be a storyteller and you know the bangalore bird watchers field club and stuff they tell stories they are scientists but they are able to instill this interest into you know people like me who was in who was in third standard at that point in time uh, by telling stories really and so if as scientists we can learn how to tell stories and then of course weave it into our scientific training which is very dry by the way very very dry to just use models and you know this that and the other and only use numbers or existing theory or all of that um if we can weave our story into that because obviously you need to uh, also look at evolution as a force you also need to look at urban ecology as a perhaps a lens that you want to look at it and then you will do much better at attracting things i was of course very lucky to have the saras crane as the storyteller for me and all of the stuff that we started to discover was all good news i mean all the politicians that i met really loved meeting me because i was not giving them any bad news all the bureaucrats loved meeting me because i was saying that the way in which they were allowing or rather the people on the countryside were using the wetlands is great you don't need to kick them out you don't need to take on additional burdens they loved it and the of course csr now human beings being an integral part of the landscape is a very new thing but even when i started in 98 or 99 people loved the story that one of the tallest flying birds in the world coexists with one of the highest populations and the oldest populations of farmers in the world that is such a compelling story and i was very lucky to find that and to start working on a species that lends itself to some really nice stories and of course it helped that it was a species that nothing was known about which is really true of most indian species very little is known about most indian uh, you know species beat mammals or beat uh, birds insects though, of course it's is even worse and so the 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 unknown is always very mysterious the unknown is can be and the mysterious can be both scary and exciting so it is up to you as a scientist to make it interesting and less scary and so this whole doom and gloom thing that we have developed as conservationists which is of course true uh, for many species which is of course true for many habitats the doom and gloom thing doesn't lend itself to people participating in a bouncy way they participate in a very reluctant way they are participating in a way which says oh gosh we are producers as csr people we should give some money because you know it's on our conscience but they ought to be much more exciting ways especially given the country that we are living in we should be able to say much more stories that would be fanciful to a western ecologist because things like you know bangalore having so many species of birds still and most of those birds are breeding and you know lalbagh saw its first golden back woodpecker post covid what a fantastic story that you stop traffic and you have a very large woodpecker starting to use the parks in the middle of the city what a really nice uh, fabulous story to say and exploring those things and trying to give those things as reasons why we need to be exploring our natural world both in terms of natural history and in terms of science i think can make for a very compelling argue argument but we are not trained in being storytellers so i think that's where we need to 
read a lot more of Ruskin Bond, read a lot more of Gerald Durrell and read a, and listen to David Attenborough a lot more because he makes everything so easy. He makes everything into such a compelling story. And to listen to people like that and to try and bring that into our own work. Wow, that's a very important lesson that I've learned today. <laughs> okay, I have some questions from the audience. So um, we have this question. Um, okay, I don't know the full name, but it says CE Sunshine. How this bird deal with the use of chemical in the agriculture? Are there any observation on this? In general, many bird species are affected by the use of chemical in agriculture. So most of the birds that we've been working on don't seem to be impacted by chemicals too much because we are working in a place which is monsoonal. So I suspect what is happening there is there is a massive dilution impact because of the regular monsoons. So in years when there is no monsoons, I suspect that the chemical uh, accumulation or the chemical concentration goes up. But fortunately, the bird that I'm studying on for a long period of time, the Saras crane, is omnivorous. So it does not do, perhaps it does not do accumulation of DDT like, you know, insectivores do or purely carnivorous birds do. But strangely enough, we have not seen deaths or anything of even carnivorous birds like the black neck stalks or the woolly neck stalks or the adjutant stalks either. So it seems like there is some dilution that's working on the landscape. Or it may be that in that particular landscape where we are working very, very strongly monsoonal, they perhaps don't use that many pesticides. We do see very large number of bird deaths in other crops like cotton, for example, or soybean or sugarcane. So these three crops are extremely bad it appears for the concentration of chemicals that seem to be always available to birds because we keep seeing birds dying in these cr uh, three crops so rice and wheat could be very healthy but you can only put rice and wheat where there's a lot of water so it is they, those are not crops that are very friendly to drier areas and they are not definitely not crops that should be brought into dry areas because then you would have to bring in water and and that just changes everything. It's, of course, very good for the saracens, very good for people like me who like going behind saracens. But it causes a huge amount of damage along the way and perhaps not the best way to manage agriculture. So these particular birds, especially in the areas where they have very healthy populations, it seems like the combination of weather and the limitations that the weather imposes on the kinds of crops you can put seems to be a very nice, happy marriage. And that's what I mean by saying I was very lucky to walk into a very happy story. Um, there is this another question, which I think is uh, largely about certain species being large sized uh, from Prasad Kumar. Uh, for instance, we have Great Indian Bustard as an example, which is again a species that occupies uh, agricultural areas, but probably more uh, restricted Grass in its range. Yeah. Grasslands, so oh, sorry. Uh, and then we have uh, large water bird, which are actually doing great so he's just wondering why uh, is that the case i mean it looks like that you have already uh, covered it during your presentation but if you want to share a few more points so we have a whole bunch of smaller birds as well that are doing really well so if you look at little ring plovers in the countryside for example there's they breed they're breeding very very well they're tiny tiny birds uh, and they're plovers they're highly insectivorous they're they eat only worms and insects and stuff they also seem to like this combination of tiny wetlands, which allows multiple uh, ring plowers to live on the landscape. And in our work on cities, which I'm doing primarily with students, so they're the ones who are the experts. So I might make mistakes in the explanation. So what the students have been uh, with the students, what uh, we've been discovering is that the species that are specialists, you know, species that are supposed to be declining in other cities like insectivores or omnivores or even frugivores, because there are so few fruits that are found in temperate uh, cities. They are not uncommon in Indian cities. In fact, they are the most abundant and the most common species in Indian cities. So clearly our understanding of the relationship of cities and birds and everything in between, the food, uh, the nesting habitat and everything else, we really need a lot more of basic observations that need to be done systematically. You know, it, uh, it has to be systematically and properly done. I mean, you could do it through organized uh, citizen science and other things, but it will require a sort of a systematic approach. But I suspect we will find that subtropical cities are doing, especially cities in India, are doing much better because of our cultural practices. By that, I mean things, I use that very loosely. And by that, I mean things like, you know, not all villagers inside a city will give up their land. So in Bangalore also, you have patches of agriculture, you have patches of grazing areas, you have a patch which is a, which is a village well or a village pond. And then you suddenly have this grove of trees, which are uh, you know fig trees that the temple will not allow you to cut. So you have this whole series of things that are happening in our cities, even in congested, crowded cities like Delhi and Bangalore, 
that very likely make our cities a lot more attractive as bird habitat at the landscape scale, not just at tiny scales, but also at large landscape scales, that we first need to figure out if that's true of you know different cities. And then we need to do, I think we really need to do a lot of work to figure out why it is so, because these are very nice examples that we can potentially provide uh, learnings to other cities where bird populations have been decimated. Of course, the cultures there are different. They are not, you know, we are largely a Hindu population. And then with that comes a whole suite of practices and stuff, which seem to be benefiting a whole bunch of things. And there are other religions and other places where hunting is very common, for example, in the U.S., even whooping cranes that are an endangered species and that are they are trying to slowly bring it back, they are regularly shot because the culture of shooting is inculcated in kids. And it is thought to be a very good way for the kids to bond with the parents. Uh, we have other problems in places like Southeast Asia, for example, where people are very, very poor. So you will, you will see hardly anything on the countryside because they, everything is eaten. Uh, poverty, along with a very long practice of enjoying wild meat, has created a very dangerous situation in Southeast Asia across a large geography where it seems like animals can only be found inside protected areas. So you have this whole bunch of bad news around the world and India seems to be this very interesting, fascinating place where there are thousands, I mean, there are literally millions of people, 1.4 billion apparently now we've beaten China, but we have not lost too many vertebrates. Of course, there are species like the Great Indian Bustard and there are other species that require vast areas which are doing badly and which will likely not survive uh, over the next couple of generations because there's no way that we can provide them the space and the uh, the places that they need. If they're able to evolve behaviors, you know, like the Saras has done with triads, if they're able to very quickly evolve behaviors, which seems unlikely, then they might survive for way longer than we give them credit for. So that is a situation where we ought to be saying a lot more of I don't know and try and go and investigate why is it that we have a fantail, uh, two, two or three species of fantail in some of our cities. And these are insectivorous birds. What are they doing in gardens? How are they finding so many insects in gardens? And what are they doing in cities? Why are there so many grey hornbills in our Indian cities? They're supposed to be birds of the forest. They're supposed to be birds that require fruit. So obviously, there are lots of fruits around in our cities. Why do our cities have so many fruits? So these are all basic, essential questions and very, very simple things to measure and to look at, which can perhaps yield fascinating and what are currently two ecology textbooks, they will be very novel findings because these are all contrary to what ecology textbooks will tell you. Wow. Okay, so from one ecology question to the next, <laughs> um, someone called Single Shot Media is asking after listening to your talk, I'm intrigued about the idea of protected places. Should we increase them from protection of species or work toward coexistence outside? Um, I think both. this is something, yeah, um, please, please go ahead. Well, you should do both. I mean, if you look at woodpeckers, for example, if you have an area without trees, you will not find woodpeckers, right? That's, ob that's obvious. So if you want to protect a tiger, then we would all prefer that the tiger is inside the jungle and not roaming around in cities. And if you have an uh, animal like the elephant, which unfortunately in many areas has gotten used to crops, causing enormous damage to people who are already poor and they're causing, you know, uh, deaths of people who are already poor. And that's a very unfortunate situation that we have created by perhaps not maintaining our wild areas, you know, without weeds and without invasive species that have, in many areas, I understand it has led to decline of food for those species. So we need to be doing both. And in our country, we also need to be doing something that is at the intersection of these two, because all of our protected areas have a buffer area where they interact with human beings. And a vast proportion of our protected areas still have people living in them. You know, BRLs and Sholigas are very famous. Northeast India is extremely famous for people who uh, have been living in the jungles as part of their culture. So we are not a we are not a people. We are not a country where we can do purely protected and completely exclude people, or purely people and not have any wild species. We are not that uh, you know that country at all. So we ought to be really writing our own conservation textbooks. And we don't have enough stories that are done a little bit carefully, that are done a little bit thoughtfully, you know, without having to uh, only mimic, uh, you know, what Westerners are saying. Because if you want to get a paper published, Monica knows this and several of us who have published papers know this, you have to say things that seem to be the style at that moment. And many of us have done this thing of saying that maybe rice fields are a, a sink to Sarah's crane. And I've written that in some of my earlier papers because... The reviewer asked that I write it because the reviewer was American and did not know Indian situation. And I was early student and I did not know the Indian situation well enough. 
And so we really need to be writing our own textbooks and open our eyes. We should definitely keep concepts. We should definitely keep trends that are available from other textbooks, other areas in mind, because those are wonderful tools to use. But we should probably be using information from our countryside, our protected areas, and trying to figure out what is required in our country to manage our landscape. So if you look at endangered species like, say, you know, some of the larger woodpeckers, the black woodpecker, or some of the very, very specialized woodpeckers like the hard-spotted woodpecker, so if you get rid of uh, dense canopies, those birds are, are going to be the first to go. You really cannot have a slaty uh, woodpecker in an area which has sparse trees, but you can have the uh, you know brown-fronted woodpecker in in agricultural landscapes because it seems to be okay uh, uh, in having low populations, perhaps low population densities, even in areas where trees are far apart. So you really need to be looking at it in terms of the entire community that you're interested in conserving, and that's where it gets complex because. The moment you start looking at a community, then each species will draw you to different conclusions because each species would have evolved different requirements. But that's also where the opportunity is for us to start contributing both in terms of natural history, piece all the natural history together into a, a lot more complex jigsaw, if you will. Okay. Um, I have one question from uh, Mr. San Satya Mocha. Um, and I think this is something related to what I keep hearing from people who go for bird watching in, uh, in uh, wetlands and uh, see either a uh, bird utilizing really degraded wetlands and they say that, oh, it looks like that they are uh, not really bothered. Uh, his question is more about uh, a reservoir made for irrigation in suburban Ch Ch Chittorgarh and was wondering what will happen as the reservoir dries up. So the loss of uh, wetland or their degradation, how is that uh, going to affect so many species that are using uh, these habitats? Well, the, the, the short answer to that is I don't know because you'll have to look at that particular reservoir, you'll have to look at that larger landscape and uh, try and figure out if there are enough wetlands for them to disperse to. There are some species who obviously will find numbers reduced because they are super specialized. They will require uh, a large amount of wetlands and they might have started to build new populations because of this new source of water. That would have definitely have happened. But you also have to consider the larger context of species and you have to be a little bit dispassionate there and not become uh, too much of an animal activist of every single individual because we are in a crisis situation where we, I think we cannot afford the, uh, unfortunately, we cannot afford the risk of going after each individual animal. So if we are as a, a collective of people who are interested in wild animals, able to ensure that all the species survive and you know some of them will be in very low populations some of them will be fragmented some of them will be in very high populations all of this put together will have to be the future of the species that we are living with and uh, in cases of artificial landscapes that are created like agricultural landscapes and especially with uh, situations like reservoirs you will have this burst and boom you will have a bust uh, you know you'll have a boom of uh, wetland related species when the reservoir comes but remember that when the reservoir comes you'll also have a decline of the species that did not need so much water it's just that they were invisible to us and as the reservoir goes away you're very likely to see the bust of the wetland related species but you're very very likely to see the re-emergence of a lot of species that don't require so much wetness or don't do very well in wetness so ours is a changing landscape and ours is a landscape that very unlikely we can keep constant you know even Bharatpur which is one of the most famous wetlands in the world we know it goes through uh, regimes of complete drought we know it goes through regimes of complete uh, over flooding we know it's seen an era with the African catfish which was eating even chicks of saras cranes and it, the catfish was eating parakeets and moorhens that's how big the catfish used to get and now slowly we've started to remove the catfish and we've seen the re-emergence of all of the native fishes within three years We've seen all of the native fishes come back because the uh, Bharatpur is still connected with the outside rivers and there are still populations of these fishes that, uh, that are doing very well outside. So ours is a truly wondrous landscape. So if you give it time, I think most places and most species seem to do okay. So I would be less pessimistic and a little bit more optimistic about the fact that we are changing things up. Uh, and as we change things up, we will likely benefit some and not benefit others. There are very few species that are super, super specialized, like the Great Indian Buster, the Indian Skimmers, a whole suite of, uh, you know, uh, freshwater turtles. There are many insects like tiger beetles and stuff that require open areas and wet areas during the monsoon. So those super specialized species are the ones that very likely we cannot very easily bring back. But even those we've seen in reservoirs and stuff, we've seen amazing populations of tiger beetles 
of species that were thought to be forest species and they're doing fine in a reservoir. So there is a lot we actually don't know. And so we keep a mind open and, you know, larger scale development, you know, I, I work in villages, so I've seen villages that still don't have electricity. And that ought to be criminal. I mean, having uh, such a high human density without electricity or, you know, forget about drinking water, forget about medical facilities, without electricity to this day, that ought to be criminal. So there will be some development that will be required so that people have basic amenities. And that's not something that we can deny uh, our people because that's really inhuman. But remember, a lot of these species are there on the landscape because of these people, because of the lifestyles that they are born into. It's not a choice. You give them a choice, they'll, of course, they'll probably be sitting where I am and giving you a lecture on conservation. But they are the, they are the people who uh, are the people that we owe a lot of these species to. Even species like, you know, tigers and leopards and elephants, a lot of farmers are responsible for very, very good populations surviving through the year. So we really need to look at human beings as being an integral part of our system and stop considering it as saying, oh, we are doing something seriously wrong or we are doing something seriously good. I don't think those extremes exist too much except for, of course, uh, a suite of species that are super specialized. Okay, so there is one question from uh, Mr. Dinesh Chaturvedi who is intrigued uh, by, um, by the relationship that Saras Kray in particular had with, the, let's say, Zahangir or he says that he has also heard about Aurangzeb. So why uh, this particular species has interesting relationship with uh, Mughal emperors? So the few Mughal emperors that you will see a lot of natural history writing, they are not writing just about the Saras crane. They've written about the skittering frog. So we hear about Euphlictus, Sinoflictus for the first time. They, it's, it's behavior of jumping on the water. And you know we hear about it from the writings of these uh, uh, naturalists. And it goes back beyond the emperors as well. We hear about Chinese travelers. We hear, hear about it about from Portuguese travelers. And so anybody who's interested in natural history seems to have looked at a whole bunch of species. And people who are living in the Gangetic floodplain, you know, Jahangir and others came into Delhi when it was in the peak of its uh, Western Gangetic floodplains. It must have been a phenomenal time because if you look at the paintings of the Mughals then, their hunting scenes show flocks of birds and they show species of birds that you cannot imagine today. Of course, Okhla and the surrounding areas and of course Haryana and other areas still have huge numbers of uh, unbelievable numbers of bar-headed geese and others uh, coming so they lived in a time where they you could not help but bump into a saras if you go horse riding into a marsh so and if you're a naturalist and if you're bumping into a saras you would do natural history and these were kings and so they could put the first imagine the first color band that we hear about being put on an indian saras screen was made of gold i'll never get to that level of uh, <laughs> of fundraising monica but uh, these are people who had the ability to do the stuff. And it is really interesting that they sat for a month and watched a crane to figure out what the incubation period was because they were very good naturalists. And these are people who observed everything. They've observed butterflies laying uh, you know, eggs and they figured out which, were the, which the host plants were. They've made descriptions of Batesian mimicry. They've made descriptions of caterpillars behaving like snakes. So they were just good naturalists. And so it is not just the Saras crane, but if I give a talk or if somebody else who is more competent gives a talk on butterflies through human history, I'm sure you'll get a lot of people in history who have paid attention to butterflies and made copious notes about their natural history. Wow, I now know what you mean by telling stories. So <laughs> I need to learn this from you. Okay. Um, I have one more question from the audience, but I think I'll go and ask my question first and then uh, because I'm the one who is asking the question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, from, I mean, I was just reading uh, about you and this particular statement uh, was something very intriguing to me. You said uh, introducing coexistence in areas where they may currently be weak. This sounds fascinating and challenging at the same time. Can you please share uh, what do you mean by introducing coexistence? Are you trying something on these line already or is it something that you plan to test in the coming years? So if you take India as a country, this is happening at, at a subcontinental scale. And it's a quite a phenomenal, not a natural, but a completely unnatural experiment that's happening all around us. Cities are expanding. New irrigation canals are being built. Uh, you have roads and highways being expanded and also some highways being closed down. I mean, this is, if you look at this country in ecological terms, it's a huge number of experiments are occurring uh, across scales that you and I cannot imagine in terms of putting an experiment into place. So if you think about Saras cranes, which was the focus of my talk, 
there are areas in Rajasthan where irrigation canals are being brought because I don't know what wisdom people have, but they want to bring rice into desert areas. I have no idea why, what the logic is. But along with the canals, the Saras cranes are coming. And those farmers have never ever seen a six foot bird. The biggest they've seen is a Godavan, which is in a four and a half feet. And they've never heard a bird that is so loud like the Saras crane. They think it's a ghost bird. They think it's an evil creature and they're very scared of it. And so that's what I mean by saying coexistence. You bring another farmer from say Pratapgarh or Chittorgarh and have meet this farmer and saying, hey, you want to come over to my village? We, we see this every, every day. And this is the crane that I wake up to in the middle of the night. Whenever Neil guys come into our field, this crane gives a call and we are able to come out and drive away the Neil guy. That's probably something as simple as that is what it will take. And I've had examples which are quite stunning that tells me that people are naturally interested in this no matter what level of poverty they are in. So when I used to ban Saras cranes in uh, Uttar Pradesh, there was one particular chick that we banded where the farmer who owned the field came over and he helped us ban the crane. And uh, they were banned. They were color bands. They were not uh, transmitter bands. They were not transmitters. So we, we were not following every single one of those uh, chicks that we were banding. But one and a half years later, he stopped me in the middle of the road and said, where is my, where is my crane? And fortunately, I happened to know where it was. And it was about uh, 20 kilometers from, as the, as the crane flies, 20 kilometers from his village. And this guy, when he heard about it, I got to know much later that he took his bicycle that Sunday. He cycled 20 kilometers through very bad roads, went and met the panchayat of that thing and took them to the wetland, showed them the bandit crane and said, that's my crane. So make sure that the wetland is okay. And so people do amazing things when you're able to interact with them and you give them the respect and dignity, you know, when you, when they want to come and help you in uh, stuff, allow them to come and help you, not allow you, but actually you are in their fields. They're allowing you to come and work in them. So if you treat people as equal, I think there'll be a lot of interesting opportunities that you and I are unable to think of as sort of trained scientists who put on these blinders and we don't have an imagination that, you know, perhaps our tribal colleagues will have or our farmer colleagues will have. So there's a lot of things that you could do with what I mean by saying introducing coexistence. And this is not in terms of what is happening in Africa, for example, which is very, very colonial. And a lot of Africa is being taken over by, for uh, you know colonial purposes and farming and other things. They're trying it in other countries right now. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a country where people are used to living with animals. They know more about the animals than you and I will when we enter a place uh, for the first time. Not in, not in ecological terms, they may not have peer-reviewed papers. But, you know, the, like the first nest that I entered the water thinking that the crane is going to leave the nest, all the villagers stood by watching me and saying, what is this crazy idiot up to? He's going to get beaten up because they knew the crane's attack. And I just did not speak to them because I thought that some fellow living in America knows better than the farmer in Uttar Pradesh. And that one nest completely changed the way that I view the natural world, the way I view science, the way I interact with the people in the areas that I work with. And that single... Sarah's screen attacking me and all the villagers laughing. That completely changed the way in which I sort of viewed the world as a scientist. I mean, peer-reviewed papers are important, but they're important for a very, very small number of us. The world outside is a lot more interesting, and we can definitely look at very interesting ways to make them part of our world. And we have to do a lot of stuff to become part of their world. I think you answered uh, even the viewer's question, which is, what okay. is your view about the human interaction with Sarah screen, like the case of one person keeping one pet? So you have answered that question as well. Okay, I think uh, now, because um, I realize that working in this landscape can be really challenging, as in you have to actually wear multiple hats. Um, this particular project that you have, Sarah Scape, uh, I was intrigued and I wanted to read more, but I thought, why not ask you? Uh, so can you share what is the goal of this project and what is the scope of this project? How many uh, countries this project is on? Um, I mean, right now it is an informal project because I've stepped down from the Crane Foundation uh, looking at new adventures, but the SARA still remains. We're still doing a lot of work on SARA's cranes. And SARA's scape was formulated with the humility that we need to be looking at the landscape through the SARA's lens. So rather than viewing uh, areas as political boundaries, I wanted to view it as an area where you find cranes and where you don't find sarases. So any area where we find sarases was going to be, you know, is, is included in Saraskate. And so our work in Australia, for example, helped show that the cattle farming in Australia was a huge, huge benefit to the saras cranes. And until our recent surveys, again, some American and some Britisher used to think that all of this cattle farming is detrimental to Saras cranes and they are declining. We showed exactly the opposite because we went and met the cattle farmers and we saw that they were creating new wetlands to give water to the cattle. That's what they were doing. 
And each of those wetlands has now been taken over by a territorial SARS crane. So in every place where they're creating new wetlands, the population of the cranes is going up. And so uh, a SARS scape is a, a sort of a concept where we allow the cranes to we, we allow the cranes to limit where we work because obviously we have to limit ourselves in terms of time, in terms of resources. But nothing else should be limited. We should be open to looking at everything that benefits or does not benefit a, a, a SARS crane. That was the concept. And so it's in its in, in its very simplest form, it is exceedingly vague. But it's delight it, it has been delightfully refreshing because when we go to Southeast Asia, obviously the SARS cranes are not found outside uh, protected areas. And there you really have to pay a lot of attention to keeping protected areas alive. In India, 99.9% .9 of the SARS cranes are found outside protected areas. So definitely we should not look at protected areas in the strictest form, but we should be looking at community uh, used landscapes like wetlands and grasslands and grazing areas and so on. So that in a nutshell is what SARS scrape was founded upon. Wow, <laughs> what a fascinating session, Dr. Sundar. I mean, it was, uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, it was worth waiting for. <laughs> I can definitely say that. <laughs> Hopefully so that the others ends, also feel the same way. Yeah, I think I'm pretty sure. Uh, so that uh, I think is the end of my list of questions. And also I don't see any question from the viewers. So uh, with this, I think I would like to thank you so much for making time for this. Uh, more than one hour of conversation and sharing this three decades of your research work. Very fascinating. I would love to come with you if, if you allow to be part of your project, intern <laughs> with you, whatever. <laughs> It'll so be fun. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Thanks for everybody for listening. And I hope this has been as interesting for you as it has been for me. Thank you.